Well, it is a special joy to be able to be with you again face to face. Even if your beautiful smiles are, are hiding, you're still beautiful. And God is with his people as we celebrate this resurrection morning. And so we want to consider what uh, this celebrated day is, the resurrection morning of Christ. And we want to consider the topic that Christ is risen. From Matthew 28, verse 6, this was the first declaration of the resurrection of Christ by the angel on that first Easter morning. And since that time, not just one or a few people have heard that blessed message, but in this last week, there are hundreds of millions of people, probably several billion people around the world that have celebrated and have honored the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, can we have our... Okay. So we want to look first at the meaning of Christ's death and the power of his resurrection, which are the foundation of our Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14, 17, and 20, we can read, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is empty. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first of those who have fallen asleep, the first to be raised from the dead to everlasting life. Hallelujah. Only the first. We're waiting for our turn, right? Our placement there. And so we want to consider on that day when Christ was crucified on the cross, it was a Passover day in the Jewish calendar. The holy day of the year when the Jews celebrated their deliverance from slavery in Egypt because the last plague, the last judgment of God upon the Egyptians was the death of the firstborn, and God provided a way for the Jewish people to be saved from that judgment of death. When they would put uh, the blood of the sacrifice of a lamb upon the door of each of their homes, then they were protected from death. And so on that day of Passover, there was deliverance from death. There was protection. They were released from slavery in Egypt when, when Pharaoh told them all to get out of the land after all of these judgments from God upon them. And as they left, it was only the beginning of the celebration every year of that Passover, all up until even today. The Jews and people around the world are celebrating Passover, but we celebrate it as Christians with the knowledge that almost 2,000 years ago, on a Passover, Jesus Christ became the great and final lamb that was slain to rescue us from death. When John the Baptist announced the coming of Jesus, at the River Jordan, he said to everyone, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The declaration of his purpose for coming in life. Now, how would you like it if someone introduces you? I'm glad Pastor Dick didn't introduce me and say, Oh, this is the man that's going to die. Okay? No, that does not sound like the most pleasant introduction. And yet, that was the purpose of Christ coming to the earth. To come as a lamb to die for the sins of the world. As the Apostle John later wrote, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever will believe in him will not perish, but be given eternal life. Amen? Praise God for the wonderful gift of God. Now, before the Passover, when the Jews would celebrate it, year by year, they would select a lamb without spot or blemish. He was carefully inspected, uh, nothing wrong. The lamb had to be perfect, no blemishes, no infection, no cuts, no, uh, no sickness. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. 
And so the lamb was inspected very carefully so that a perfect sacrifice, an innocent lamb, would be killed to take the judgment and the punishment of sinful man. And before Christ died, he was thoroughly inspected. First, taken to Pontius Pilate, who inspected him, who interrogated him, and then Before the people said to them, as recorded in Matthew 23, verse 13 and 15, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, but having examined him in your presence, I find no fault in this man concerning the things you have accused him of. Pontius Pilate saw Jesus as the innocent one and understood that it was through jealousy that the priests wanted to eliminate Jesus as this great new competitor for the hearts of the people. And so, after Pontius Pilate declared him innocent, he was sent to King Herod. And King Herod, again, investigated, interrogated him, found nothing wrong, sent him back to Pilate. He was thoroughly inspected as the lamb without blemish, the man they could find no sin in. Even centuries later, a man named Muhammad, who wrote what became the Koran, wrote in the Koran that Jesus was sinless. While he himself prayed many times in the Koran for his sins to be forgiven. Now, which prophet would you want to follow? The one that Praise repeatedly for forgiveness of his sins? Or do you want to follow the sinless prophet? Amen? We follow Jesus, and he is much more than just a prophet. He came as the sinless lamb of God. And so, the sinless Christ took our sins. As the apostle Paul wrote, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This was the great, wonderful, divine transaction that Christ, the sinless one, would die as the punishment for our sins so that we, in turn, could receive his sinlessness. He took our sins and he gave us his forgiveness and his sinlessness. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, it even declares that Jesus was the lamb slain from the creation of the world. Now we know in history he came, he lived, he died. We sang that wonderful song. And it was historically, almost 2,000 years ago, he came and died. But in the purpose of God, in the foreknowledge of God, when God knew he would create man with free will to love him or to wander away and do his own thing, God knew that man would become like sheep, wandering away, doing their own thing, living in sin, rebelling against God. And so, how can man be reconciled? Back to God, Jesus was the lamb slain from before the creation of the world. And the plan of God, God the Father and God the Son, considered how man would fall away from him and turn to their own way. And and how could he be rescued? And echoed in the words of Isaiah chapter 6, God the Father said, who will go for us? Who will we send? Who can rescue sinful man? And it was only God the Son, the sinless one, that was qualified to say, here am I, send me. I can complete that work that you will send me to. And so, as Christ had the sins of the world placed upon him at the cross, there was a time when the sin of the world was placed upon him. The Jews had the symbolism of laying hands upon the sinless animal sacrifice to confess their sins and that that animal would die for their sins, although the animal was innocent. 
And when Jesus had hands laid on him, when he was taken and nailed to a cross, there on the cross for a short time, God the Father turned away his face from Christ. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because the perfect one was carrying upon him on the cross the sins of the world. Cursed is he that dies upon a tree or upon a cross is the commandment of God back in the Old Testament. And Jesus became a curse for us so that we could receive his forgiveness as he cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. Crucifying the great I am who co-created the world and the universe with God the Father. And yet he humbled himself to leave the glories of heaven and come down and become a man who humbled himself to the death of the cross for you and for me. And as Christ had his fellowship with God the Father taken away, he had the sin of the world placed upon him as God judged him instead of you and me. Now, many years ago, when I was uh, going to become the director of an evangelism center in the city of Detroit, in the USA. Before that, God helped prepare me for that ministry and leadership. And uh, 1977, okay, I was praying for Detroit, evangelizing it and preparing for this center that was going to come. When God the Father started to place upon my heart the burden of the sins of the city of Detroit, the metropolitan area of 8 million people. Now, have you ever felt as you're praying for people, as you're thinking about someone, have you ever felt the burden of their sin? And you just know the heartache they're going through. You just know the loneliness or the pain or the shame. Have you ever felt that praying for people? That's interceding. That's going in their place to feel their pain and to intercede to take their place. Well, this one night as I was praying for Detroit, God started to lay upon my heart the sins of all of the people of the city. And it started out as weeping, and then it went into groaning and travail like a woman and child, and it grew even more intense so that it was agony. It was like I stuck my fingers inside, uh, you know, the 220-volt socket, and, and I was screaming in agony because I was feeling the pain of hundreds of women who had just been beaten up by their alcoholic husbands. I was feeling upon me the heart's cry of the young children who did not even know who their father was. I was feeling the, 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 the pain of the countless drug addicts in the city that did not know how they were going to get their next fix, their next uh, drugs to alleviate them from their uh, addiction and pain. And in this short season, it was more than my body could endure. And God ended up lifting it from me. But he wanted me to understand so that I could have compassion upon the city that we would evangelize. But Christ did not just have the momentary uh, pains of a city, the, the sufferings of one time. He took upon himself at the cross all of our suffering. All of our pain, all of our shame of everyone who has ever been born and ever will be. So that through his intercession, through his suffering, the Lamb of God could prepare the way for the sin of the world to be taken away in the mercies and forgiveness of God. And so as Christ cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even the sun became dark and refused to shine when Christ became sin for us on the cross. But as Christ was dying on that cross, just outside the gates of Jerusalem, it was the Passover when all the Jews had come to celebrate the, the, the death of the lamb that would save them from death 
They were coming into Jerusalem to attend the Passover, many of them passing by Christ on the cross as they were entering the gates and then climbing the steps up into the temple. And as the Jews filled the temple on that holy day, at 3 p.m., as the high priest was going to kill the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, this was exactly the time when Jesus died on the cross as the final great perfect lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And as Christ died, the scriptures record, there was an earthquake that shook. And inside the holy place, separating the holy of holies from sinful man, the veil was torn in two. The way to the very presence of God was opened at the death of Christ. And that veil in the temple of Jerusalem was six inches thick. It was cloth that weighed thousands of kilograms. And it was estimated and written that it would take 12 teams, 12 yoke of oxen or palankarabal to be tied up to be able to tear that thick curtain in two. But the Bible says in that earthquake, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. It wasn't Carabao on the bottom, stretching and breaking it. It was God the Father's hand that ripped open the veil that separates God from man. When Jesus died on the cross as the Lamb of God to make the way open for you and for me. God's love is so incredible. And after Christ's death, that was only the beginning. What happened to Jesus? While many of us can recite the Apostles' Creed, crucified, dead and buried, descended into hell. What happened was Christ, in death for three days, went down into the lower parts of the earth. In 1 Peter 3, it's described, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, to bring us back to God being put to death in the flesh, but still alive by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. The Bible records that before the resurrection of Christ, the gates of heaven were not open to the righteous dead. They descended into a place in the lower parts of the earth where they were waiting for the first one to come. And set them free, just as the Israelites had waited in Egypt for the death of the Lamb to set them free, to journey on to the promised land. The righteous dead were waiting for the coming of their rescuer, of their redeemer. And then it also says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, when Christ ascended on high, he led captive a multitude of captives. And gave gifts to men. But when he ascended on high, what does this mean but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? At his death, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Not a captive of death. He had declared in John 10, I lay down my life that I will take it again. No man takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it back. And so Jesus died willingly to descend into the lower parts of the earth, to descend to rescue the righteous dead that were waiting for the deliverer. And there, proclaiming his victory, Christ then rose with the keys of death and hell. He met the apostle John as the risen, glorious Christ. And he said, I am he that lives. And I was dead and I'm alive forever. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Hallelujah. He holds the keys to your life, to every life, to my life. And so, now the way to heaven is open. He has opened the grave. 
And he is inviting us that as we follow the path of the cross, we will follow that path that will also lead us to the crown, lead us to the heights of heaven. We all will follow the Lord in his sufferings as Christians, but, yes, next slide, but we will also join in his resurrection. We will go from a crown of thorns and the sufferings of this present life. We will go to the crowns of glory that Christ is going to bestow upon his risen saints, upon those who will rule and reign with him forever in his coming kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, as he was dead and in the lower parts of the earth, proclaiming liberty, taking the keys of death and hell, waiting for the third day until he would arise again, the high priest and the leaders of Israel went to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and they said, oh, this imposter said before he died he was going to live again. And we, now that he's dead and put in the tomb, we don't want his disciples to come and steal the body and say he rose from the dead. So please, will you give us a, a, a company of Roman soldiers to seal his tomb so that no one would dare to steal the body of Christ? This is another proof of the resurrection, that this seal was placed upon the tomb, and they would stamp with hot wax a stamp upon the center, and then ropes going to the edge, to the, 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 the stone uh, outside of the, the, the rock that sealed the tomb, and to the wall of the cliff there. They would seal it, stamp it with the Roman seal, and this Roman seal was the pledge that the Roman Empire's power would keep that which is sealed closed. Whether it was sealed on a letter or sealed on ropes to a tomb, anyone who broke that seal without the permission of Rome, there was one and only one penalty, death to the ones who would break that seal. And to those who were committed to enforce it, if Roman soldiers were to enforce something that was sealed, they had to fight to the death to keep what was sealed remaining sealed. If the seal was broken, then the Roman soldiers had only one punishment. They would die. So the Roman soldiers had good motivation to, to watch the tomb, to defend the tomb, to defend it to the death or else they would die. And so the tomb was sealed, and by the authority of Rome, nothing, no man, no power would open that closed tomb. But, hallelujah, there is a greater power than the great empire that Rome was. That is the kingdom of God. And the scripture tells us on that Easter morning oh, almost 2,000 years ago that a shining angel rolled away the stone and declared, he is not risen. Or, he is not here, for he has risen. And declared the resurrection of Christ. And it says that the Roman soldiers that were guarding the tomb, it says, when the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes shining as white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook, they fell over and became his dead men, overwhelmed by the glory and power of one who had more power than the empire of Rome, the one who would break the seal and declare he is no longer there inside the tomb. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And so because the stone was rolled away, some of Jesus' disciples went in shortly afterwards and inspected, and they saw that the tomb was empty, except for Jesus' burial clothes. Now, I could not find a proper picture for you to see. This shows, you know, burial cloth, 
scattered there on the ground inside the tomb. But that's historically not accurate. Because when the Jews would wrap up a dead body in linen and then mix up with that linen spices and the oil of myrrh, we read that an incredibly huge amount of the liquid myrrh was bought by uh, the wealthy ones that uh, had come to uh, help uh, bury Jesus. And the linen was coated with liquid and with spices that would harden into a hard shell. There was a cast around Jesus' body, except they would not put that on the head of a dead body. They would just put a napkin on top. And so the Bible says that when Peter and John went into the tomb and they saw the burial clothes, they saw the cocoon, the outside cast of the hardened linen clothes that were made like, like if you've ever seen a, a cast on a leg, you know, made out of cement. That was the hard cocoon that had, Jesus had been wrapped and, 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 and sealed within. But it was not cut open, and there was nobody inside. Jesus had risen from the dead, and he didn't need someone to saw open, you know, the cast and set him free. No, he didn't have to worry about that as the risen Christ. And so the scriptures tell us that he first met Peter in a secret meeting to encourage him after Peter had, had so failed God and cursed and denied Christ. Then Christ appeared in the upper room to most of the apostles and then later appeared also to doubting Thomas. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that in one occasion, over 500 disciples saw the resurrected Christ. Many people saw him in his resurrection, heard his teaching. Thomas, uh, don't, don't doubt anymore. Go ahead, stick your hand in my wounded side. Put your fingers in the holes in my hand. Don't be doubting. Believe. And blessed are you who sees and believes but more blessed is the one who has not seen, but still believes. He is risen and is alive forevermore. And so, as the disciples saw the reality of the resurrected Christ, from hiding in a locked room, afraid the Romans might arrest them next, instead, they became bold they were following the one that even death could not stop. And so they preached with boldness in Jerusalem. Thrown into prison, an angel brought them out. Kept preaching. They kept going forward. And for years, they preached throughout Israel and went to the nations. Doting Thomas went as far as southern India, history records, preaching the gospel. And there he started uh, churches and had many converts that even today, I have preached to some of these people in these ch from these churches. It's called the Mar Thoma Church. Mar for martyr, Thoma Thomas. The martyr Thomas churches in southern India are three-fourths of a million people. And they trace their heritage back to when doting Thomas no longer doubted. He preached and he sealed his testimony, dying as a martyr, stoned to death by a Hindu mob. But there were all of the others. And if you could read this all, James was stoned and beaten. Matthew was beheaded. Simon, the zealot, the other Simon, uh, uh, he was crucified. Thomas, uh, tortured and died. By follow you beheaded. Judas, the other one, beaten. Philip stoned. Uh, Simon Peter, crucified outside of Rome. Andrew, crucified. Hi, hi, hi. There was only one of them that did not die as a martyr. Only the apostle John. All of the rest sealed their testimony that Jesus is alive forevermore by dying for their faith. And if they had just made up, you know, some story, well, we'll just say he's alive again and, you know, we'll keep this a new religion going. They wouldn't have died, tortured, 
persecuted. Incredible pain. Some of them crucified. They wouldn't have suffered that if they just made up a story about Jesus being raised from the dead. It was the reality of the resurrection that caused them to have such faith to go forward. And only one of them did not die as a martyr. He was the Apostle John. And he was sentenced to death by the Romans for being a Christian leader. And history records, they dropped his body into a pot of boiling oil. Ladies, do you know how hot oil can get? It's boiling, okay, a lot hotter than water. Water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. Oil will be two or 300 degrees. They dropped him in the pot, and he didn't cook. He didn't burn. And they put ropes in and pulled him back out. He wasn't hurt. And they were so afraid of this man they couldn't die. They didn't try to kill him again. They sent him off to a prison island, Patmos, where God gave him the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. It wasn't God's time for him to die. It wasn't God's way. He ended up dying as a very elderly man. But because he was sentenced to death, and the early church thought it was such an honor to be a martyr, they listed him as an honorary martyr in the martyrs of the early church. Now, how many of you uh, want the honor and glory of being a martyr for Jesus? Any volunteers? Or maybe you'd like to be a, a, an honorary martyr, okay? <laughs> But that was the reality of the risen Christ in the lives of his disciples. Death could not stop Jesus, and death could not stop his disciples. And so, the early apostles were beheaded, crucified, stoned, and, and killed. And then the Roman Empire declared uh, the death for the Christians, and many of them uh, burned at the stake thrown to the lions in the Colosseum, and there, countless times, as the Christians waited for the animals to come and devour them, they were singing the songs of praise to God. And for every Christian that died, more people believed when they saw the reality of the faith of Jesus, the reality that these Christians that were facing death knew they were going to live again. And so, one of the early church leaders coined a phrase that's famous in history. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Do you want to plant good seed for a harvest? The blood of the martyrs is the seed through which the church has grown through the nations. First, Jesus, the grain of wheat, that was put in the ground and died to bring forth a harvest, and then all of those who follow in his path. And so, down through history, countless martyrs believing in the resurrection of Jesus. There were hundreds of thousands of Christians in Japan four centuries ago when the, the, the pagans in Japan, worshiping their emperor, declared war against the Christians, and martyred, massacred hundreds of thousands. But the Japanese emperor had heard that the Christians had a faith that even though they die, they will be raised from the dead. And so he tried to, you know, tried to uh, make sure of all the things and, uh, you know, uh, just count, you know, just make sure everything was okay. So what he did was he cut off the dead bodies of 11,111 Christians, one, 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 cut off their heads and had it shipped by sea to the farthest northernmost islands of Japan, right up near Alaska, and buried their heads there, kept their bodies in Japan. And he said, ha, if they do raise from the dead, they're not going to have their heads anyhow. They're no trouble to me. Do you think that's going to stop? Do you think the power of man is going to stop the power of Christ's resurrection? Nope, such foolishness. There was a man named Wycliffe that translated the Bible in England. And uh, he preached and multiplied disciples and, and was the first to translate the Bible into English. 
And the Roman Catholic Church had difficulty uh, arresting him as a heretic because at that time there were two and then three popes. And they all argued which was the real pope. And then they all got armies and they fought each other. And so it was hard for them to get their act together and, you know, arrest this, uh, this preacher over in England that was teaching the Bible. But after he died... They were able to, uh, to condemn him to death. Well, he already died. So they, they took his bones out of the grave, and they burned it in ashes, and then they threw the ashes in the local river and said, look, the local river goes into the Thames, and the Thames goes into the sea. His ashes are dispelled. There will be no resurrection for him. There will, he is gone. But his disciples said, no, he will be famous forever. The first one to translate the Bible into English, starting revival among the English people. You think you have stopped him by uh, putting his ashes in the river, scattered to the sea? No, just as his ashes have been scattered to the four corners of the oceans of the world, so his teaching and his Bible translating will go forward. And today, the largest missionary organization in the world, thousands of people translating the Bible all over the world, are the Wycliffe Bible translators. No, even though we die, we will live on, and the works of God will go forward. Now, 40 days after his resurrection, the Bible tells us, Christ ascended back to heaven. And there was a great celebration When the victorious king returned home, it's recorded in Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10, prophetically, where when David brought the ark of God's presence, the symbol of God among his people, he brought this into Jerusalem to take God's presence, the ark, up to Mount Zion. As he came through the gates of Jerusalem, David wrote a psalm to celebrate the coming of the king. And so, in the scriptures, it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up that the king of glory may come in. A group of priests probably announcing the coming of the ark into the gates. And then, in typical Jewish fashion, there was a second company that replied back in a reply and is a question, who is this king of glory? And then the first group of priests shouted out, The Lord, strong and mighty in battle, lift up the gates. The King of glory is coming in. Well, that was prophetic of the one who would come through the gates of the new Jerusalem. Not as a gold box symbolizing God among his people, but Jesus being God among his people, entering the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem. And the angels probably uh, welcomed him with a great celebration. Swing wide the gates of heaven! The king of glory is coming home! And maybe another group of angels said, who is this king of glory? And the first group, it's the Lord Jesus, strong and mighty in battle. He has conquered death and the grave. Hope and wide the gates of heaven. Our king is coming home. Oh, what a celebration they had after Christ's ascension back to the Father. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, we get another further glimpse of when Christ ascended to the throne of God. And it's said here, As my vision continued, I saw someone like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One on his throne. And the Son of Man was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race and nation and language will obey him. His kingdom is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. That's the testimony of when Christ ascended back to the Father to be given all power in heaven and earth. And as Christ now reigns in heaven, waiting for us, his servants, to complete our task our great commission, 
that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel and declare to the world, he is risen. The Lamb of God has taken away the sins of the world for whoever will believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And as we preach and declare the reality of our Christian faith, Christ is waiting in heaven for the time of his soon return, welcoming each of his faithful servants as we die and we go to heaven to be raised to eternal life. And as he is waiting in heaven, he is there as the triumphant king of kings who will return soon in great power and glory to rule the world. And until that day, we say, he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we will now want to hear his words. All power has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go into all the world and preach the good news. We have a commission from our king that we are to fulfill. So let us go forth from church today with fresh faith in the resurrection of our Christ. Many great proofs of his resurrection your changed life, my changed life is a testimony. The transformed 12 apostles, they were a testimony. The martyrs down through history are testimonies of the, of the faithfulness of God and of the coming resurrection. And let us go forth with that faith. And if there is anyone here that is not sure of your faith in Jesus Christ, You've probably heard countless times Jesus is the Savior. He was born in Bethlehem. He died on the cross. But do you know if he is the Lamb of God that has taken away your sins? If you are not sure, today is the day to make your peace with God. Now is the time for you to know that the Jesus who asked for forgiveness as he was nailed to the cross, is the same Jesus that invites you now to confess your sins, to turn to Christ, to believe he died for your sins, but he rose again to give us eternal life in his kingdom. So I would like, please, if we can bow our heads, close our eyes. If you're listening on Facebook or Zoom, let's look to the Lord and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have heard this message about Easter, the message of the resurrection of the Lamb of God, why Jesus came and why he came for us. Lord, just as we are, without one plea, O oh, Lamb of God, we come to thee. Lord, you are the Savior of our souls. And Jesus, I confess my sins. But with that, I confess and take you as my Savior. You died to pay the price for my sins. Forgive me, Lord. And make me born again. Give me of your eternal life that I will walk with you and serve you and love you and be a Christian a true Christian from this day forward. And through eternity, we will sing of your salvation and your grace for your glory, for your praise, for the love of God that has been shown upon our lives. You have saved us and given us eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lamb of God, we come to you today.